Welcome to the Eights Frame podcast. My special guest is a family member of mine, uh, my cousin Steve Vaughn. We're going to talk to today about Steve's life and especially his tour in Vietnam, um, which is a very special occasion in his life, meaning that uh, when you joined the, the military in 1965, you joined the Marines, uh, life can sort of throw some curveballs at you, and um, and they did. And uh, Steve's got an interesting story, and we're going to talk about it today. How how you doing, Steve? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I can hear you fine, Patrick. I okay. Very well. Now, Steve is... Uh, we're first cousins. Uh, our dads are brothers. Uh, our family grew up in Longview, Washington, and then later Seattle. Um, our grandfather was a greenskeeper uh, at the Longview Country Club. And our uh, our uncles, or at least the, the, the brothers, were uh, pretty good golfers. And they, they grew up in Longview, which is a lumber town, and later Seattle. And you, you were born in Seattle. Is that right? I was, I was born in Seattle. I, I think uh, if, if he wasn't, your dad was still a baby when they moved to Seattle, I think. That's right. He, he was born in Longview, which is, a, which is a lumber town. It was a planned community along the Columbia River, right? Um, yeah. Yes, it's 120 miles south of Seattle. Yeah. And your, your dad was the oldest of the brothers, and my dad was the youngest of the brothers, and you're one of the oldest of the cousins, and I am literally the youngest cousin. So we span a generation, but we, we have a lot in common in a way because uh, we remember we have 25 first cousins, I think. I, I tried to count. Is that right? Does that sound about right? That's, that's pretty close to it. I was, by the way, I was, I'm closer to your dad's age than you are to my age. I, I was thinking about that. So you remember my father. What was my father like when, when, uh, when he was a young guy? Yeah. Well, he, he was, um, he was the baby of the family. Yeah. Uh, I like, I, I remember all my uncles and my dad sitting around talking and your dad, uncle Jerry was yeah. sort of the accident of the family. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think he was 15 or 16 years younger than my dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so he got, he got sort of a mixture of it. And when I, when I was growing up, your dad was a pretty good athlete. He yeah. was a, became sort of a famous basketball player in the city of Seattle because he played basketball for Seattle University. Which was pretty good at that time. They they, they beat the Globetrotters, right? That team uh, with yes, the O'Brien brothers. Yeah, yeah. They had they had two guys, Johnny and Eddie O'Brien, and your dad played for them. Yeah. And uh, shortly after that, a guy named Elgin Baylor came and played for him, and he yeah. was a good player too. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that was the coach was Al Brightman. Do you remember that Al Brightman? I, was, I, yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't particularly remember his name very well. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do remember as I grew up and sort of matriculated into school, I got into an all boys school called Seattle Prep. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's where your dad went to school. Uh huh. Wow. And uh, some of the guys that were my teachers knew your dad. Uh huh. And he was there, your dad was their hero. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I got C's when I probably should have got D's. Oh, but it's because because of your dad. Oh, is that and, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and Jim. Har somebody, yeah, Jim Harney was the point guard on that Elgin Baylor team. Um, yes, he was. Yeah. He was my he was my algebra teacher in my freshman year in school. Yeah, and and uh, there was a guy named Paul Dempsey that was my history teacher. Yeah. That was also an assistant football coach. Mister Harney was a you know, his uh, assistant football coach too. Yeah, and uh, he made me turn out for basketball because of your dad. Is that right? I, I've he never heard these would, stories. Yeah, so I, I really with that, he yeah. said anybody with that name should be a basketball player. So I had to turn out as a freshman to, for basketball. And you were let's let's talk about your life a little bit. You were born in 1946, which is obviously right after the war. Um, your your dad was in the navy, right, Uncle yes. Dick? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me something about your father. Yeah. You know, I think your dad was in the Navy too, wasn't he? He was. You can see him right here, I think. Uh, I, think I know. I can't him. see the picture. Okay. By accident, but... I think I'm pointing at him his picture. But yeah, he was in the Navy. 
he got drafted in the Korean War. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to talk to Cousin Jim about uh, Admiral Clifton Sprague next time. But uh, um, your dad was in the Navy and you come from a military background and, and you were a kid. You said you were kind of a rebellious kid. You were born in 1946 in Seattle. What was it like growing up in Seattle? Yeah. Well, uh, Seattle was a unique sort of town. It was a, in those days, it was a one industry town and the name of the company that ran the town was Boeing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, Boeing makes airplanes. Yeah. I don't know if you guys over there know it, but yeah. they had, uh, uh, prior to Boeing getting there in the thirties, Seattle wasn't much of a, much of a place. It was a drop off point for everybody that was going to Alaska. Yeah. When Boeing started, by the time Boeing was started in the mid thirties, yeah. And by the time the war started, the big war, yeah. uh, World War Two, yeah, uh, they had thirty thousand employees in Seattle. So that that and, yeah, it was a boom town. Well, yeah. Well, I'll give you a little potpourri because all for nothing it doesn't mean anything. But where I was raised was called the central area of Seattle, mm -hmm. and that's where all the black people lived. Yeah. Prior to World War II, there were no black people in Seattle. Yeah. They weren't allowed. Uh huh. When World War II started, Boeing to keep the plant going had to, they recruited twelve hundred black families. Yeah. And brought them to Seattle and gave them jobs at Boeing because in those days, black people didn't have to go in the military. Uh huh. The only the only job they could get in the military was that of a cook. Uh huh. You know, so they didn't have to. So they brought them to Seattle. Well, they made them all live in the central area, and. Uh, when it, that was a pretty nice area originally then it became sort of like the ghetto type area when i was growing up uh -huh. i didn't think of it as i didn't think of it as a ghetto because i didn't know any different yeah i didn't know the difference between really i didn't because of my mother i didn't know the difference between black and white really if i had a friend who happened to be black it just it just was because he was black that's all so that's your mother, Ann Fowl. She was she was pretty open minded person, huh? Back then. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What was I she would, like? Yeah. What was your was mother more, like? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Patrick, she was more fair minded than open minded. Okay. Okay. Yeah. She expected when I was at St. Teresa's grade school, I moved there in the fourth grade. Uh, by the time I was in the fifth grade, I had a lot of black friends. Yeah. And uh, they could come over to my house. And they could be okay, but if they came over to my house, they had to man their own load. They had to help clean up the house and they had to help do stuff. So guys didn't like coming to my house too much. <laughs> but, but they well, they liked my mom. I when uh, she Yeah. When I'd go to baseball practice and if she showed up at baseball practice, she expect the same work out of them as she did out of me. Yeah. She was and, tough. Uh, she was tough. Yeah. I remember her. And uh tough, I rem but, yeah, tough yeah. but fair. Tough, tough but, but fair. fair. And your father yeah. was in the Navy. Uh, Uncle Dick was in the Navy. How did he, what was his upbringing? They, he was the son, son of a greenskeeper, right? Yeah. yeah, he was the son of a greenskeeper and he was a, he was a, a very smart guy, but a very good guy. Yeah. And uh, uh, he dropped out of school when he was a sophomore in school at the University of Washington and got a job working at a paper plant. Uh-huh. And then the war started, so he had to go in the Navy. He was spent four years in the Navy. And uh, uh, when he got out of when he got out of uh, the war, he decided he didn't want to work at that paper company. So he got a job as a manufacturer's representative. That's somebody that represents manufacturers in the office supply and office furniture business. Uh -huh. And he covered Washington, Oregon, all by himself, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. Uh -huh. So he so he was gone a lot. So my mother was the one that had to raise us pretty much. And she didn't have much with seven kids. She didn't have much time for for tomfoolery, which was I was good at. Yeah. OK, so you were a little bit of a rebellious kid, huh? You were. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. And for a couple of reasons, too. I was the only person that was, a. Uh, I never saw a B and the rest of my family never saw a B from different ends of the alphabet, okay? 
that's when I was matriculating at school. What do you mean by and, that? Uh, Your grades weren't great? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Yes. That's <laughs> what, I'm being kind to myself to say I was a C minus student. So you didn't like school. Why didn't you like school? Yeah. It bored me. It bored me to tears. Yeah. And uh, and I wish I'd have had it to do over again, but I don't, so I didn't. And uh, I just didn't care about it. The only thing I cared about was getting out of school so I could go play baseball or yeah. going to Seattle Prep so I could play football on their football team because they had a good football team. That was an all-boys school. Yeah. <laughs> so... You do you do you remember how Seattle changed with the World's Fair in 1962? Do you remember the Space Needle going up and all that sort of oh, thing? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I used to take the bus. I took the first time I went to this to the Seattle World's Fair. I took the bus down there to it. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was on Queen Anne, which was we called that a geographically undesirable area because you had to take a bus to get there or drive, and I didn't drive. Yeah. And who the heck wants to go to Queen Anne Hill? Yeah. Except for that's where they put the Seattle Center, which was right on the corner of downtown Seattle. And uh, that's where it was. You know, I, I tell you that, but I only went to the World's Fair maybe three times in my life. Okay. Do you remember a couple of history? I mean, you were, I'm trying to do the math. You were in high school when John Kennedy got shot. Do you remember where you were then? Oh. Yeah, I sure do. I skipped school that day. Yeah. I, I was I was getting ready to get on a bus to go to downtown Seattle, and I heard about it on the news. So I wanted to be the first one to tell everybody. So I went back to school. I took the bus to school and walked up the hill to the school, but they had already found out about it. And all I did was get myself in trouble for skipping school. I said, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I told him I was late and had to go to the D. My brother was the oldest, and so he got a little bit of attention being the oldest. Yeah, I was number three in the family. I had an older sister, so she got attention for being a girl. Yeah, yeah. And then I was number three. And then when my mom, when I was three and a half years old, almost four years old, she had another, she had identical twins. Yeah, yeah. Well, identical twins was a sort of a special thing for women in those days, and they got all the attention. Yeah, yeah. So... So you kind of felt you didn't really fit in there, and you you went to Yakima College on a on a to play football, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story about it. It was a good school, by the way. Yeah. So I'm, um, as a, I didn't do very well at the school. I liked a girl. I played football there, and uh, did okay. I ended up at at the end of the year, my freshman year, I was starting on the team, and the next year I was ready to go. But they got a new coach, and he decided I was too little for the team, so I had to work my way back up again. And uh, I liked this girl who dumped me and ran off with a rich guy. Yeah. And so, so all of that coming together, getting D's, my football coach not admiring me, the girl dumping me, I decided to quit school and join the Marine Corps. And this is December 1965, and there's a small war going on at that time. Huh? Yeah, the war was starting to pick up, and I... There were a couple things about it. I, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be in the Navy because I didn't want to sit 40 miles offshore lobbing sh things in on people. Yeah. I never wanted to ask anybody what was it like. Yeah. So the Marine Corps had a thing. I was attracted to the Marine Corps because it was the toughest. Yeah. And they had a, they had a deal. They just started that you could join the Marine Corps for two years active duty automatic you had to go to vietnam automatic you had to be in the infantry then you had two years active reserves and you had two years inactive reserves so you had to do six years uh-huh and every marine has to do six years but yeah. that's the way it was broken down at that and so that's what i signed up for and uh and tell April me about tell me about that first day you did you go into downtown seattle and sign up in some office or what was it like did you uh right, you know kind of interesting i signed up in renton washington okay yeah yeah and that's where i live now in renton uh -huh. washington yeah but uh and what was I that day up, like were, were you nervous nah you just sign a piece of paper and say see you in three months yeah yeah. You know, but they don't say see you in three months. You got to go down to downtown Seattle and at five o'clock in the morning, you get on an airplane and they take you to Los Angeles or actually, yeah. actually you go to San Diego. 
And you went to Cape Pendleton, Cape Pendleton, Camp Pendleton Camp, for your Camp, basic Camp. training? Yeah. Well, you do basic training in San Diego. Then there's a base called Camp Pendleton. And that's after you get out of boot camp, you go to Camp Pendleton. Yeah. And that's right between San Diego and Los Angeles. Yeah. And what was that like? What was your boot camp like? Well, well boot camp for me was real easy because my mother was so tough that all you have to do in boot camp is, is you hear a lot about the Marine Corps boot camp, but it's actually, if you do what you're told, when you're told to do it, it's not that tough. Yeah. And you keep your mouth shut and your eyes open and do what you're supposed to do. And you told and me that's, uh, that's December of 65. You joined and, and, and you shipped out to Vietnam. What was your fish first day? Like in Vietnam, you flew out of LAX, Los Angeles. And um, I flew out of LAX and yeah. they put me in a, I got affiliated with a group called Kilo company, third battalion, fourth Marines. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I didn't know a soul. Yeah. And I went up there and they were, they were out of a place called Dong Ha. Uh -huh. And that was a, the biggest city north in North Vietnam and uh, north in South Vietnam. That was the biggest city. Uh -huh. It was about 25 miles from the DMZ. Uh -huh. What's the DMZ and, uh, for, uh, for younger people? Demilitarized zone, right? And that's, that's yeah, important. Demilitarized yeah. zone. That's what it Vietnam is. was. Vietnam was cut in half. Um, we'll talk about Dien Vinh Phu here in a minute, but uh, so you were, you didn't know one person and you're, you're shipped to Vietnam and uh, were you scared? I mean, were you nervous? What, yeah. what was it like? And you're, you're 20 years old, right? You know? Well, I was 19. I turn, had my 20th birthday and my 21st birthday in Vietnam. Okay. Yeah. But, but yeah, I was, I was uh, alert. I was, you know, trying to pay attention because I wanted to know what the hell was going on. And I, I, I didn't want to spend any time falling asleep when somebody gets me because I'm falling asleep. And that's where, well, that's what usually happens to, to people that are doing that kind of stuff. They get caught napping. So maybe, okay. maybe, maybe for people who don't know war or don't know the military, can you describe your, maybe your typical day in Vietnam? What was your typical day like? And where were you? You were at, uh, what, what? Well, you're, you're bouncing around a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I got to Dong Ha. They gave me a rifle and it was dirty and muddy and full of nasty stuff. And I said, what the heck, what the heck is this? He said, that's your rifle. Clean it up because you're going up tomorrow. Yeah. I said, where'd this rifle come from? He says, probably a dead guy. Well, that got my attention too. So I had to clean up my rifle, get going. Uh, two days later, I'm up at a place called Camp Carroll. Yeah. Camp Carroll is named for Captain Carroll, who was the, the CEO of Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines. And about three weeks earlier, he got killed in a firefight. And, and so they named this camp after him. Uh, right after that, right after that, they transferred us to a place called Contien, and we built Contien, and we laid the wire, cut down all the trees, all the stumps, and, and that's dug our own fighting holes. And let's talk about that. That's right on the DMZ. It's about uh, five kilometers away or just a couple miles oh, no. away. You know? It's, it's 1,200 meters. So right on the border. Yeah, you it's know? right on the border. You, there weren't very many places. As a matter of fact, I don't know of a place that was further north than Contien. Contien means the Hill of Angels in French. And what was it like? What was your day like there? Well, well <clears throat> boring. Yeah. Okay. And the reason it was boring is because you're standing watch all day, every day, all night, every night, but there's nothing to look at except yeah. a field. Yeah. Okay. And every fourth day you go out on a patrol. If you went out of the concertina wire is what it's called. Yeah. And you went on a patrol. If you went to the left, it was absolute jungle. If you went to the right, it was jungle but they had areas where there was just nothing but tall grass weeds and uh and uh those are the only two places you can go either way and, and it just paralleled the dmz which was north vietnam basically and you told me that you you were you told me a funny story where you offered 
you you wanted to walk point you volunteered and tell me that story what was that well, what was that about you know? when i first got there when i first got there they worked work patrols three different different ways okay uh -huh. and, yeah. and they were on they were on battalion sized patrols company sized patrols or platoon sized patrols uh -huh. and uh i volunteered to walk my my outfit was was the point platoon so i told my sergeant butler i said i'll walk point on this thing sergeant butler they said why do you want to do that you know what you're doing i said no but i've seen enough tv i know what's happening i watch enough the lone ranger and and uh, those kind of shows i can pay attention to what's going on and so i did and i did and i got pretty good at it yeah what what if was good about I mean how could you be good at walking point maybe for a, a younger audience it's well, just, what, well, did, what 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 does it mean to walk what point? You, yeah. you start yeah. paying attention to funny things okay yeah. if you're of course if you're hacking your way through the jungle there's nothing but to hack okay yeah. Yeah. but if you're walking on a trail that's on a thing you start looking for funny things and, and uh, things that are different yeah. like footprints yeah okay you don't think about that but when it's raining they make footprints. Uh, yeah. broken down grass wow. if, if, if it isn't raining and they're walking in front of you or going another way you can see the the broken grass and you can see something's wrong with there uh broken limbs on a tree if you see broken limbs on a tree something's they're carrying something that's breaking those limbs there's something going on so what was your job? What what your job at point was to go out and find and and we've talked about this. There were not so much the VC you were worried about. You were worried about the NVA, right? The 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 organized well, yeah. formal military, right? And, and I think I told you that too. And I'll tell you again that it was yeah. Uh, yeah. there were actually two different kinds of battles going on there. Yeah. There were the in the southern part of Vietnam they had what was called VC Viet Cong. Yeah, and there were guys dressed in black pajamas that had a different philosophy from the other people down there. So they'd go in small groups, and and sort of like guerrilla warfare, they'd go in small groups and attack somebody, then run like hell and get away. Yeah. Up, up north, we fought. What we fought were the NVA, and they were trained, disciplined army troops. And and armed by they, the Soviets in China, right? I mean, very yes. heavily armed, right? So yeah. very. Uh, and they had a rifle that was very much better than ours. They had an, what was called an AK-47. What's that? that tell, was, tell us about that rifle compared to yours, because we've talked about that before. You had the M-16, and we talked about the difficulties you had with that. Um, yeah. Well, when I first got there, Patrick, I had an M-14, yeah. and I loved that rifle. It was it, it was a heavy rifle, fully loaded. It weighed 14 pounds, yeah. but it was dur it was durable. You could get it a little bit dirty, and it would still work. You had to clean it up once in a while, but it still would work if it was a little bit dirty and it was reliable. Yeah. The M16, I got my six month in there and it was made of plastic. So you didn't think much about it right like that. It was very much lighter, Yeah. but it was, they had some things in it that were inferior and it yeah. didn't work very well. They it would, would jam. How well it, it would jam, would, right? That's yes, the, it would jam. Yeah, and it would jam. I, I, whoever wants to know this, I'll tell you why it jammed. It jammed because when we first got the ammunition for it, they used a low-grade brass. Yeah. So when you fired around and it exploded in the chamber and the shell, the the bullet went out, the shell stayed in the chamber, but it brass was so cheap it expanded, so you couldn't eject it out of that chamber. After yeah. two or three rounds, it would expand and you couldn't get it out of there. You had to break your rifle down, take your cleaning rod, knock that shell out of there, fold your rifle back up, put your magazine back in it and start firing again. And in three more rounds, it would do the same thing again. So you're at a disadvantage, incredible disadvantage. And you, the, you also, the, you, I'm sorry, but you also told me that the AK-47 was a superior weapon. What made that a superior oh, much, weapon? Much, much, much superior. Why is that? The name of this it's an AK-47 because the guy that invented it was a Russian and his name was Kalashnikov. Yeah. And at the end of World War II, he came up with it. And uh if you could leave it in a mud puddle for two months. You could you could pick it up out of a mud puddle after being there two months and it would still fire. Uh -huh. Okay. It would not jam. 
it never did jam. It, it they had a the Americans couldn't come up with a thirty round clip. It had a, they all they could get was a twenty round clip. Yeah. The AK forty seven had a thirty round clip, so that's one third more firepower that you had when you're firing it. Okay. Uh, if you started firing an, an M sixteen and you fired an automatic rifle. Um, if you could get it going for a full 20 round clip, it would be so hot. You couldn't pick it up. You had to pick it up by the plastic parts. AK 47 didn't do that. You also it told me, from, I'm sorry, yeah. but the, so they had a superior weapon. I mean, it, the worst thing you can ha imagine having in a firefight is a weapon that jams, right? That's I right. Mean, you know, and, and, and do you remember how, frightening it was to be in a in combat when with a weapon that was unreliable you know like. i remember vis vividly i remember mostly because it's one thing to walk with a rifle that that you know is going to jam to but if you're a squad leader or a fire team leader and you're responsible for 12 other guys and all their rifles start jamming you can't you can't run a battle that way you can't Steve, do things effectively that way and Steve, you were a squad leader. Can you tell me about that? What what was it like being responsible for other people? Well, well it was it was a, a dual thing. I, I got two meritorious promotions when I was over there, and I became a fire fire team leader my third month there. Yeah. Well, the guys that were in my fire team were like brothers, and we were friends, and we did things together. But that's like it's a little bit like you going next door to your good friend and you going out partying all afternoon and. And they were part yeah. of your group. But yeah. when you become a squad leader, then all of a sudden you're responsible for 12 guys. You don't know all of them very well, but they range from 18 to 21. And some of them are just kids and brand new kids there. And you have to have the responsibility of keeping them alert, anxious, and alive. Okay. And you're and, only and you're only 20 years old yourself. Yes, and I was only 20 years old myself. And then when you get it, you get into that group and you're going out on a patrol and you know your rifle won't work. If something happens, you be you 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 take very good care of them and you you don't do anything stupid. Uh, I've always felt that there's a difference between uh, a major difference between courage and discretion. Now, can you explain that? Courage is when you're walking point and something happens and you continue walking point and you go after them and get them. Discretion is you're walking point and your rifle's not going to work and they come after you. You don't go after them. You pull back and say, hey, wait a minute. There's a whole group of them here. Let's call in artillery on this group in there. And that's the difference. And I, I prided myself when I was a squad leader of using discretion more than I used anything. Uh, I didn't want to make it, if we took fire, I didn't want to get online and start assaulting that place when I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know how many of them were there and I didn't know if my rifle was going to work or not work. Yeah. So I would just pull back and call in artillery. And if it was one guy or 50 guys, I called in artillery and I called a lot of it in because it wasn't my money. I didn't care. I just didn't want to get any of my men's loss. Can you tell me what it's like calling in the artillery? What are you talking about? Air cover? I mean, uh, well, uh, Contien was an art. Contien was an artillery base as well as a place for us to go on patrols. Yeah, yeah. So they had maybe maybe twenty one oh five howitzer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Artillery, and uh, the very first time I called in artillery, I can tell you, I was out on a patrol, and. Uh, I called in artillery and what we what you do when you call in artillery is you 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 call it in then you wait for it to land then you say come in come left 100 yards come south 200 yards okay and then when you got it where you want it to go you say fire for effect yeah then they'll fire three rounds in 10 yard increments and then three rounds and 10 yards increments going the other way like a cross. Yeah. Okay. That's how they do it. The very first time I called in artillery, I called it in and uh, I'm sitting there with my buddy Grimsley 
and uh, they said we fired a round and what they do when they fire that one round is called a Willie Peter round and it's white phosphorus. It blows a big, huge white puff yeah. of smoke so you can see where it is. Yeah. I, I'm waiting for that to come in. The guy says, we fired that round. What are you doing? I said, oh, well, come down one grid square, which is a mile, and said, come over one grid square. Yeah. Which is another mile. He says, where the hell are you? I said, I don't know, but I'm getting the hell out of here because you're not even close to us. Yeah. And I got in trouble for that. But that was where I learned how to do fight, call in artillery. And another thing I did not want to do, Patrick, did yeah. never want to do is, uh, and a lot of people do this. They accidentally call in artillery on themselves. There's a lot of friendly fire in uh, content. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because he didn't know what they were doing. I wasn't going to do that. That was not going to be my... Uh, Steve was a nice guy. Too bad he died. Too bad yeah. he called artillery on himself. <laughs> he, he should have paid more attention at school. <laughs> C minus. <laughs> Um, yeah. what about what you, we were talking about the, the different strategies. Now you're, you're a 20 year old kid, but the, the Vietnamese North Vietnam had a general named Jop who was famous for his technical, uh, he was, Patrick, um, he was a genius. He was, why, a, he was, a, he was a genius. Why, and, why so? Uh, because from a military standpoint, he knew how to keep everybody off balance. Yeah. He knew how to attack, when to attack, and how to attack, when not to attack, and when to when to run. Okay, he got he he became famous at a place called Dien Bien Phu, which is where the French were in 1952. And and just to back up a little bit, Con Tiem was referenced a lot in 1967 when you were there that it was going to be the next Dien Bien Phu. So wh why don't we back up and talk a little bit about history and Giap and Dien Bien Phu? Because did you know okay. about that when you were 20 years old? Probably not. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't know much about it then. Yeah. Because you had no place to find out about it. You couldn't walk to a library. You couldn't yeah. do anything. Yeah. You know, you got you got two meals a day. You got there were no people around you when you're at Contien. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're in the jungle. There's nothing to do. Uh, the one thing I did do is I is helicopter pilots would bring books out. And so I read, I became a copious reader when I was over there. You were a be reading right. in Vietnam. You, you were a yeah. soldier and you were reading. You know? yeah. 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 But uh, anyway, uh, Dien Bien Phu was in North Vietnam. There was no North or South Vietnam in those days. It was 1954, and the, right? And and let's yeah. talk about a little bit. The French are there because it's a Indochina was their former colony, right? So yeah, well, they had been there about a hundred yeah. years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right and and they were they were taking advantage of the country. There were a couple of things that they could get out of there. One of them was rubber. Yeah. From the rubber plants, uh, there were a lot of things, natural things they could take out of there, but they took the thing over, and. Uh, the French were great fighters, but they're not good tacticians. Uh -huh. okay. Any book you pick up, you, uh, you read about the French in World War II and they lost a million, 600,000 guys. Yeah. And the reason they didn't, because their officers had no idea what they were doing and they didn't care about their enlisted men. They said, what, so what if we lose 50,000? We'll get rid of them, we'll, we'll get another 50 and do it. And that's the way they did Vietnam too. So when they were at Dien Bien Phu, Dien Bien Phu was a camp in a valley. Which is... And all around that, all around that camp were hills, yeah. okay? And so the North Vietnamese General Jap, yeah. he, and it took a lot of work, but he hauled a bunch of artillery up all those hills. Yeah. And, uh, and then he started bombarding, there were 10,000 men at Dien Bien Phu, by the way. Mm -hmm. And they started bombarding it. They didn't bombard it for two days. They bombarded it with a thousand rounds a day for 60 days. And, and uh, that's merciless. Yeah. That is merciless. And then they'd attack. Then they'd pull back and bombard it again for another 30 days. Then they'd attack and, and they just mentally beat the French to death. And, and that gets back to the point of what, what, some people thought about Vietnam is that you're fighting a limited war when they're fighting a full scale war, meaning that the North Vietnamese had nowhere to go. They lived there. 
Um, but the, right. French, the French don't, and they actually wanted Eisenhower to use nuclear weapons, right? This Operation Vulture and uh, yes, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, and, and he, he did he, it. He, you know, you know. he promised nuclear weapons wouldn't have done much. That would have been in, uh, and that's I feel the same thing about Korea too. I don't think nuclear weapons would have been a good deal there either, but yeah. they would have been more good in Vietnam. But anyway, Eisenhower said he would support him but he didn't know what he was talking about when he said he would do that. He didn't yeah. know if he was going to send troops, which he did not do. He yeah. didn't know if he was going to give them money, which he did do. Uh, and when that war became over, I guess you could yeah. call it over because yeah. the French surrendered. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he was the guy that started sending green berets over there. And he sent them over in groups of five or 10, and then they train the troops. But it was difficult for him to get a good training of those troops. Well, this, this, is, what, was doing on it. this is when huh? we get into the cultural aspects of it. I read a great book by Graham Greene called the, the Quiet American, you know, where they're talking about the Americans were going to do better than the French because they, they kind of knew how to fight this guerrilla war. And, um, and and Kennedy was reading in Fleming, and then uh, he's talking. He's reading Mao's version of guerrilla war. But we've talked about this. If if they have tunnels and they have access to Cambodia and Laos, and they know what they're doing, you you guys almost had no chance in that war. In in some ways, is that is that right? I mean, you know. Uh, well, uh, that is right, but it isn't right. Okay, tell me where Kennedy, I'm not right there. You know, you know. Kennedy got killed before the war really got going in the right direction. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. He got killed in 63. And then late 64, early 65, Johnson was the one who accelerated everything. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I believe that if he would have let the military run it, that war wouldn't have lasted two years. Explain he that. He wouldn't let them. He yeah. would not let the military run it. He gave orders to them on what to do and when to do it. Yeah. And uh, he and a guy named Robert McNamara a had a map. Defense they secretary. Map. Yeah. Yeah. They and, had and, a map. And let's talk a little bit Mac, about McNamara because he's not a military guy. He's an automobile guy, right? He comes from yeah, Ford. He's a Ford Motor Company guy. And he's a numbers he, cruncher, right? I mean, he's like a, he's a bureaucrat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's another one of those numbers game that you're getting involved in right now. He was a big donor to Johnson and he wanted to get involved in that. So Johnson brought him in. He didn't yeah. know the first thing about anything. And they had a map of Vietnam on their desk and they'd say, let's send this guys over here to do this and see what happens there. And let's send this guys over here to do that. And, uh, uh, and you're 20 years old. Did you know any of this was going on? I mean, or were you just like doing what you were told? You know, I mean, we, we did what we were told, but you yeah. get rumors, okay? Yeah. You get yeah. rumors. Yeah. yeah. And th they had a third guy involved in that name, Elmo Zumwalt. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you know who he is, you know much about him. Yeah. He, yeah. he, he was the guy. He was the guy that decided to use Agent Orange. Uh huh. Tell us about what that is. If if people don't know what Agent Orange is, it's a defoliant, right? To to get rid yeah. of. Yeah, uh... Agent, Agent Orange is a liquid defoliant, and they sprayed it over the jungle, thinking they could kill the jungle. Yeah. And uh, and then they could just knock the jungle jungle down. There would be no place for the NVA or the VC to hide. Well, it didn't work that way. Yeah. Okay. For a lot of reasons, but th that was a very 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 thick jungle yeah okay wow. and they kill the top of the trees and, and sometimes it would get down well agent orange is is what got me yeah and i got exposed to it there but it didn't it 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 didn't get me till later on in my life but but uh it killed everyone everybody that was in my squad that came home every one of them is dead now and they start they started dying at age 31 and the government denied they did anything. Yeah. Now, when I when I got my bad of it about nine years ago, they just started admitting that they they did something wrong, and and Agent Orange was responsible for my heart. You had a heart attack, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh... And, uh, and and they've made some progress on it, 
and I'm pretty lucky because I'm still around. But what, one of the things they told me after they had my, I did my open heart surgery is they said, we're going to try and explain this to you very elementary. And I thought, well, that's good because that's what I am, very elementary. And they said, it's like a little teeny Pac-Man eating away at your heart and we can't stop it. We don't know if it's going to kill you in one year or it's going to kill you in five years, but it's going to get you and we don't know how to stop it. Yeah. But we're going to carry you while you're around. Well, by that time, it had killed a lot of Americans, a lot of them, and wow. they got nothing. They got nothing for it. Yeah. And do you, do you feel kind of betrayed that, that uh, you guys were just normal kids, you're 20 years old, fighting a war um, that you told me just now, maybe I, I interrupted you, I don't want I, I to leave that hanging there. You told me that if the military ran that war, they could have won it in two years. What, what do you mean by that? You know? Well, it would, been, it would have been, you go into a village and you stay in that village and when they come out in their black pajamas and a rifle, you get them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now you don't let them go change clothes and become a civilian again. Uh, yeah. When it was the NVA, if the NVA wouldn't fight you unless it was ten to one in their favor. Yeah. yeah. Because they knew that the Americans were good fighters and good at what they did, so they had to have a good clear advantage. And that was another thing. If if you started taking good fire at me as a squad leader. If I started taking more than a pow, pow, if I started taking several rounds, I knew something was up. Yeah. And, and I wasn't going to be involved in that kind of thing if they have more than 10, 10 guys to my one guy, unless I could get those guys. That was another thing we did. Uh, after my eight month there, they started sending us out in squad size patrols, 12 man, 12 man patrols. Right. So if we could very surreptitiously bump into some a uh, huge outfit we'd call in airstrikes and call in support or if we were out on patrol and they caught us we could get a, we could get our support troops there fast enough that they they wouldn't overrun us by the time they got there and small groups going four different ways every day was they felt was the best way to do it but that, um, let me back up a little bit sure yeah if we if we just if we just sent the third marine division up where i was displaced them in the right areas sent them out on patrols and every time some north vietnamese came by we could blow them to smithereens and it wouldn't take long yeah the one mistake jap did do was he started the tet offensive well uh -huh. it was a mistake but not a mistake and i'll tell you why okay he thought he, he thought he could go down there and and attack the people in saigon da nang Pleiku, Dong Ha, and then all the South Vietnamese would sight and a place called Hue, H-U-E, uh -huh. which was an, the, one of the older cities in South Vietnam. Yeah. But he thought, that, he thought the South Vietnamese and the Amer American public would side for him and they'd come after him. Well, he was exactly wrong. Yeah. And, and they didn't. And that was the only only area where the South Vietnamese came to bat, and they did a good job down in Saigon, taking care of their people down there. Yeah. And uh, Jap lost fifty thousand Tet Offensive, which was three weeks long. They only this they is, lost this, 50, this 50, is Jap. people. Let's just back up just to to get some perspective. This is the last day of January, nineteen sixty eight, and it's a turning point in the war, right? Politically. Um, but but, yes. not, but not militarily. You, I think you're making the argument that a lot of people make that it was a military victory for the U.S., but a pol political defeat because uh, the way well, two, the way Cronkite two, covered it, for example, you know. Um, yeah, two things happened. Two things okay. happened. Okay. Cronkite covered it. Okay. Yeah. And he said, "This is a war we cannot win." Yeah. Okay. Well, he was looking at it from Johnson's standpoint. Yeah. And he was right. Yeah. And and. After the Tet Offensive, uh, the head of North Vietnam asked, asked Johnson for a truce, so Johnson put a truce out. Mm -hmm. so what that means is, and anytime the North Vietnamese wanted to, they'd call, up, they'd call up whoever it was and ask for a truce, and then we couldn't do anything. And several times when we had truces, when I was at Contien, 
the North Vietnamese would come across the, the Kua Viet River by the thousands. Uh -huh. And you have a four day truce where you couldn't find them after four days, but you weren't allowed to go get them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because Johnson called a truce. And one of the things I want to just get back to and just one of the things you told me that was the hardest part about this, you told me that you had to write letters to the, the, the families that, that of your squad that got killed. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How, how you felt about that? You know? Well, I mean, I, I felt a certain responsibility to the family if I lost a man. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, uh, you, it, it would be a hell of a thing if you had a son that went over there and he got killed and then you just never found out what was really happening. Uh, how did this happen? They, nobody would tell you. Yeah. If I lost a man and, and uh, I would write a letter to their family. And what, would you, what, what would you say in this? You know? Well, I'd say uh, I would try and be positive saying he was a great guy he was a good Marine. He did what he was told when he do it. He brought a lot of life and a lot of positive things to my squad. And we enjoyed having him. We're so sorry that we lost him. And we're sorry for your pain. Uh, maybe someday I'll get a chance to see you now. I never did see any of them. But yeah. I just said that just to, you know. And that's not that wasn't required of you to do that. You did that on no. your own, you know. Yeah, that was on my own. It, it wasn't required. Mm -hmm.